Hello, and welcome to this lecture on digital sovereignty. My name is Jamal Shaheen, and I am the current chairholder of the recently launched VUB Chair in Digital Sovereignty. I am lucky enough to be a first-hand witness of the benefits of joined-up public administrations in the European Union, as I work in two countries in the EU. I am a senior lecturer at the University of Amsterdam in the Department of European Studies and Programme Director of the Advanced Master in European Integration at the Vrije Universiteit Brussels School of Governance. My professional background has been in the area of European politics and particularly the workings of the European institutions and how they respond to digitalization. In my research and teaching over the past years, I have been keen to understand how democracy has been transformed by the digital revolution that has swept across many parts of the world over the past 20 years. In the early 2000s, I wrote my PhD on how the internet was starting to change European governance through an increased harmonization of public administration activities across the European Union. It is telling that we're still having this conversation now, which shows how technology can be a driver for change but also how there is a long-standing process of administrative and political renewal going on in the heart of Europe that will most likely provide a constant story for many research projects to come. In this session, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the concept of digital sovereignty and how I understand the term. Briefly put, it marks a change in the posturing of political actors across the world specifically entering national interests into the realm of cyberspace. In fact, I will argue that claims of sovereignty at the European level have taken Europe towards a more dynamic and active role in promoting the digital transition in these current times. And digital sovereignty in particular is the term that has been coined to describe having control over the technology that forms the basis for European societies and economies. The key points I would like to reflect on during this session are, first, defining digital sovereignty, highlighting nuances and contradictions in the meaning of the term. Second, showing how the digital transformation of public administration can act as a key test bed for a clearer understanding of digital sovereignty. And third, showing the impact of digital sovereignty on the EU. In the context of this module on digital transformation and public administration, and in light of some of the other sessions you have or will participate in on various aspects of the di this digital transition, I hope that we can come to a broader understanding of what digital transformation in the EU means not only for European public administrations, but also for European citizens European democracy, and European technology companies. I will show you, during this session, how the concept of sovereignty, which is tied very much to the idea of institutional power of a state, or a state-like body such as the European Union, links to ideas of transformation in public administration. I will do this by using a few examples that will help give a concrete and realistic understanding of what digital sovereignty looks like for public administrations. Critical infrastructure protection, identity management, two areas. Within these two areas, we can see how the institutions of the state encourage development of strong rules that reshape the way we see public institutions and may lead to very different approaches to public administration emerging in the future. In this dynamic environment, a focus on the notions of trust and accountability emerges as areas where the dynamics driving public administration and digital sovereignty coincide. As the multilateral world order, that has been a defining feature of the international system since World War II, has been challenged by democratic backsliding in young and old democracies alike, and most notably in the sense of a decline in the trust of politicians and political parties, as we've heard in another session. States are starting to change the way they present themselves on both international and domestic scenes. They are starting to claim sovereignty over transnational actors, attempting to take back control over their domestic markets. 
In the digital sphere, this has become a highly poignant issue with core debates around the power of multinational corporations that are often portrayed as being beyond the reach of policymakers. So, what is at stake for European public administrations and national governments? Well, critical infrastructure management or protection of critical infrastructure is one way in which the governments are making increased moves to ensure that they have control or sovereignty over their territory. I will talk about this after having delved a bit more into the concept of digital sovereignty. A core feature of the discussion we are having today about digital sovereignty revolves around globalization. There have been two ways of looking at how globalization affects the world, and these have led to contestation and conflict in many places, most notably in protests around Europe and other parts of the world against international agreements relating to trade, climate, and other areas of political contestation. On one hand, Globalization can be seen as an equalizer or a flattener, as in the famous title of the book by Thomas Friedman, The World is Flat. People who would agree that globalization was a force for leveling out the world would talk about the emergence of global rules for making national policies and harmonization of public policies. This first line of argumentation would lead, in broad lines, to the conclusion that the global market economy can work in cooperation with democratic states to form common rules that will allow for frictionless trade, movement of people, and so on across the world. This is a classical argument of many so-called neoliberal authors and is strongly supported by a number of international organizations such as the OECD, who authored a paper on why democracy is good for globalization in the late 1990s. Authors of such analyses would include people such as Wolfgang Reinecke or Diane Stone. One of the logics of these arguments, and others, is that there are possibilities to organize the world on a global level rather than a national one, and that we can move towards regulatory institutions and market-based systems that allow for global governance. Others, such as Philip Cerny, author of a number of articles raising the issue of the erosion of democracy, or Naomi Klein, who's the author of the best-selling book No Logo, would talk about the challenges that globalization posed for democracy. They would argue, in very simplistic terms, that globalization actually promotes what Job Besser, Bob Jessup and others have called the hollowing out of the state reducing dem democratic control over national economies and policies. This second line of more critical approaches to understanding the process of globalization has a natural consequence of looking back to the state or state-like institutions to revitalize the link between democracy and control. In recent policies and statements from politicians, we see the tensions between these two approaches to globalization very clearly. And nowhere is this more prominent than in discussions on digital policies. Digital politics has, in recent years, become the new battleground for international economic competition. Technology companies are key to economic growth and contribute to the global economy in multiple ways. And it is in this sphere of technology that we see explicit references to bringing control back from the global level. For example, European Commissioner Thierry Breton said in a speech in July 2020, in the face of growing tensions between the United States and China, Europe will not be a mere bystander, let alone a battleground. It is time to take our destiny into our own hands this also means identifying and investing in the digital technologies that will underpin our sovereignty and our industrial future. And it is here that we turn to the concept of digital sovereignty. Digital sovereignty, sometimes referred to as strategic autonomy or technological sovereignty, 
has emerged as the discursive tool to enable institutions to determine their strategic interests and promote them and even project them on the rest of the world. There is a lot of debate in academic circles about the nature of the concept of digital sovereignty. It is, to all intents and purposes, an oxymoronic term, bringing together the borderless, the digital, with the notion of control over a given piece of territory or sovereignty. It is also a relatively vague and somewhat misleading term which can be interpreted in many different ways. For example, John Perry Barlow, who is one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, claimed that cyberspace has its own sovereignty in his Declaration on the Independence of Cyberspace. In this logic, the notion of digital sovereignty would mean that the digital realm would be separate from the physical realm of national governments that cyberspace would be another country. Perhaps, according to them, the internet or cyberspace could even have a seat at the UN's General Assembly. However, the notion of sovereignty implies that there is a body of people who are unique members of that territory, which means that cyberspace would need citizens who are not subject to other national jurisdictions. And I do not see myself uploading to this country anytime soon. Digital sovereignty is thus a concept that is nuanced and is politically and contextually defined. It does not have an absolute definition, but can mean different things in different contexts, whether they be related to economic, security or communication purposes. As I have just shown, a literal and absolutist definition of digital sovereignty doesn't make much sense and would actually lead to what many have called the fragmentation of the internet. This would be the end of our global communications network and would run counter to all efforts that have been made so far. Digital sovereignty is more a politically determined statement of a vision of the digital transition rather than a clear-cut concept with a strict legal definition, which makes it super interesting to unpack, of course. And it is in this context that we can start to examine how digital sovereignty influences debates on public administration. Digital sovereignty, or one of the variants of the term, have been used by governments across the world to signify their response to the increased importance of the digital transition. One example of this comes in the area of critical infrastructure protection and management. This field of policy has come under increased scrutiny in recent years, as globally connected digital technologies have become the linchpins of our infrastructures. By critical infrastructure, I mean infrastructures that support our energy sector, water networks, financial or transport industries, for example. You can see a definitive list of European critical infrastructures defined by the European Council in 2008. These areas have become more vulnerable to attack in recent years, as we can see from the examples of cyber attacks in Estonia and Georgia, or in the Iranian nuclear production facility, or more recently in the SolarWinds attack. In all of these examples, public and private infrastructures were attacked and the results of the attacks were considerably damaging to the security and economy of these countries. Therefore, we can see that there is a need for public administrations to start to address how they can ensure control of these critical infrastructures in order to ensure that their vital societal functions are not compromised. And... As I will show later in this session, there is also a need for the private sector to engage in this debate in order to ensure that they can continue to provide service to public administrations and not have them nationalised or controls in way, controlled in ways that provide roadblocks to global integration. In some areas, such as healthcare data transfer, this is already a challenge that data protection experts, technology providers and healthcare experts need to examine how data can be, concerning global health issues can be shared across borders, thereby providing more insights into developing solutions for diseases that do not know regulatory boundaries. 
Since the emergence of new public management discourses and logic, epitomised by writers such as Peter Drucker and put into practice by politicians like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, the line between public and private sectors has been continually blurred to the point now where it is very difficult to distinguish between the two. One of the biggest problems is that cyberspace does not have clearly defined borders as countries do. In discussions dating back to 1648 and the signing of the Treaty of Westphalia, and more recently in the United Nations Charter, we have come to understand that sovereignty implies non-interference from countries on the territory of other countries. Each country has absolute control over what goes on in its own geographic space. Even if that principle has not always been adhered to, it is an established principle that most actors can rely upon. The European Union itself is an example of a very complex arrangement of overlapping sovereignties that are carefully determined through treaty negotiation between political actors and then legal and political discussions between judges in the European Court of Justice and the European Council. Cyberspace does not have the same established norms and principles, and thus protecting one's assets in the digital realm has very little legal support. This is emerging, however. The Council of Europe's Budapest, Budapest Convention, otherwise known as the Convention on Cybercrime, is one of the only binding international instruments that tries to provide rules for malicious activities in cyberspace. And work is being done in the United Nations, the G20, and other international fora to shape consensus on global norms for cyberspace. Most of this work is done in forums, or fora if you prefer Latin plurals, that are multi-stakeholder. These fora bring together state actors, the private sector, and in many cases, civil society. As I have mentioned before, the ideas of private and public are more than ever intertwined in this digital age, where public critical infrastructures are often managed by private actors and where private actors also hold vast amounts of data concerning citizens, which requires some sort of regulatory action to ensure that this is protected. The idea is to develop a dual logic of legitimacy and effectiveness in dealing with issues that cross borders and involve actions and actors from different parts of our society. Multi-stakeholder fora are a consequence of governments and public administrations recognising that they are not solely responsible for ensuring security and protection of rights and values in a digital age. However, the idea has been challenged by many as being a solution that does not bring the desired impact to the fore. Criticism is made of the fact that civil society, or in other words, the democratic aspect of the policymaking space, does not have the mechanisms to deal on the same levels as corporate and institutional interests that then dominate this form of global policymaking. Research carried out by members of our team working on a project to disentangle the logics of multi-stokeholderism have shown that this type of forum building can lead very easily to a sort of cronyism, where only interests who all agree are able to participate, thus legitimising a process that has no critical discussion behind it. We've carried out work on international trade agreements and spaces of international digital governance to try to uncover who the civil society actors in these spaces really are, and our results provide interesting conclusions as to the makeup and the activities of these actors. Our research shows that the design of these spaces is crucially important to the activities and the outcomes. Multi-stakeholder fora that have concrete powers tend to be more strictly managed, with higher transaction costs incurred for participation, whereas fora that are more open tend to have less decision-making authority and are often compared to talking shops. Principally, most multi-stakeholder fora appear to consist of established interests that do not always reflect the societal requirements that allow us to state that these fora are democratic. Most essentially, Rather than allowing for a space where critical dialogue can take place, 
they create a space where groupthink and general consensus on ways forward is already accepted. Hence, there is a large amount of criticism generated around fora that have multi-stakeholder in their title. In the end, recognition that this effort to create a legitimacy for global governance mechanisms has resulted in many states and public actors attempting to enforce their own opinions on the international scene for the protection of their own democratic values. In 2018, French President Emmanuel Macron noted that he saw two different internets emerging in the world, the Chinese and the Californian ones. He was presenting a view that Europe needed to create its own standpoint on the policies surrounding the evolution of global technologies. And this, as we shall see below, has been taken up in full by the European Union as we step into what the current European Commission has called Europe's digital decade. Different visions of the transition to a fully-fledged digital society exist in different parts of the world. Digital transformation is taking place in different parts of the world in a variety of different flavours. And different parts of the world are focusing on different aspects of digital transformation and developing their own approaches to dealing with how to react to this fundamental change in the way that public administrations and societies operate. The European Union has chosen, in general terms, to vouch for a values-driven, human-centric internet. This means that the EU has decided to focus on promoting transformation that supports its core values, the EU has been credited with focusing first and foremost on protecting this core set of European values, which are most notably recognisable in the context of personal data. As others have mentioned in other sessions in this module, the GDPR rules are designed to give rights to individuals in ensuring data about themselves is protected. This is present in a number of activities that have emerged since the von der Leyen Commission set out their key flagship activities for the current period. However, they go back far longer, as some of my colleagues have also noted in their materials for this module. One of the key initiatives that started the EU's response to the potentials of the digital transition was the eEurope initiative. This initiative launched in 1999 by the European Commission, emerged during the height of the dot-com boom, when the internet was suddenly becoming recognised as important for society as a whole. This had been noted in the United States several years earlier, where Al Gore had, as Vice President, established the National Information Superhighway as an important policy field for the US government. At a similar time, the European Commission had also published the so-called Bangerman Report, which advised EU member states on a range of different key technological investments that were required. However, this document had firmly placed the responsibility for rollout of technology in the hands of the private sector. E-Europe recognised that the EU needed to act to create a knowledge-based economy by stimulating use of dictators digital technologies in all areas of public sector and private markets. It wished to create a usable, or fast, and trustworthy, secure infrastructure for use by European citizens, consumers and corporations alike. However, although it paved the way for future regulatory frameworks, in itself, this initiative was not able to build a European approach to building a common European digital public administration, given the disparities that were present between the different member states, and also bearing in mind that the EU is about to expand dramatically in the famous Big Bang enlargement of 2004. Moving to Europe's digital decade, so the 2020s, we see that the EU has been able to formulate a stronger vision of what a European digital society should look like. It is creating a nuanced vision 
of digital sovereignty that is based on a balancing act between ensuring European core values are protected, whilst also recognizing that Europe is dependent upon global supply chains and industrial partners that operate on a global level to ensure that the promise of a global information society still continues to exist. The EU has been active in creating new legislation for digital services, digital markets and data governance. It has also been pushing forwards with directives on information security, artificial intelligence and finally the creation of a common European digital identity system. The possibility for Europe to take on a more definitive and concrete view of what its digitally sovereign vision is emerged due to a number of enabling moments that basically forced the EU into taking a more proactive role in developing that vision. First, the global geopolitical situation, with economic tensions emerging between China and the United States, forced the EU to define a line between these two combative actors. Rather than siding with one or the other, and thus alienating the other, the EU chose to take a third option, which was to focus on its own core strategic interests in cyberspace. The European Commission has presented this as being an approach that focuses on Europe's core values, human rights and data protection, for example. Secondly, the European Commission has become a more overtly political actor, explicitly since 2014 when the then president of the Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, who was boosted by his Spitzenkandidat election to the head of the European Commission, stated that he wanted the Commission to be more political. Third, the previous efforts mentioned by the EU to develop a digital Europe had often been non-binding and based on soft law. This was now recognised as a sub-optimal approach to developing and creating a Europe that would be fit for the digital age. Europe does not want to create an entirely autonomous digital infrastructure that may lead to fragmentation of the core communications network, driving the digital economy and society. But it does want to ensure that its citizens are protected. It has done this through a number of important legislative developments in recent years and of relevance to public administration and notably the efforts towards crit protection of critical infrastructures and citizens' data, as mentioned above. So what are the key takeaways of this discussion around digital sovereignty in the European Union? First of all, digital sovereignty is a concept that is to be defined in specific contexts. It has been shown that digital sovereignty means different things in a security or an economic context, and even more so in a context around the core infrastructure of the communications network. Digital sovereignty also means different things to different regions around the world, and the European approach to digital sovereignty is one that is based on protecting rights of European citizens, industry and political institutions. The EU is trying to promote its own vision of what cyberspace could look like and particularly how it will be regulated in the future in a way that tried to balance carefully between the benefits of global cooperation and the development of a set of principles that allow for European values and strategic interests to be protected. Whilst the EU and its member states work towards ensuring that European values are enshrined in the digital transition at a global level, there is also a big impact on national public administrations. Another point to note about the role of the digital transition is who is actually a public administration in the digital age? Public administrations have become more and more reliant upon private actors to provide them with infrastructure and even services to support the state. Whilst they therefore have public service obligations, the dividing line between public administration and private sector is continually being redefined and global actors are heavily invested in supporting public administrations with their obligations to both government and citizens. It is in this context 
that the debate on how we unpack the meaning and interpretation of digital sovereignty becomes very important for political actors and people like me who analyze the evolution of these terms. On the one hand, digital sovereignty is an absolutist policy objective executed by European politicians could lead to counterproductive situations where European societies are unable to reap the benefits of global technological developments. On the other hand, without some sort of protection for European interests, rules and values in the global technological marketplace, Europe risks losing out on what makes the European Union European, which is a sense of the protection of individual rights and democratic values. The future discussions in this area will be very interesting, and I invite you to continue the dialogue with my colleagues and myself. Please feel free to contact me by email. I would be happy to continue discussions either in a group format or on a bilateral level.